part of Earth Month. Uh, which it should be Earth Month. It should be Earth Year, quite frankly, in my view from what I do. But I'm really happy to be here. I'm Virginia Reddig, Refuge Manager at Edwin B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge. And thank you for eating your lunch today. I just ate mine, so I will not be eating while I talk. Um, but just wanted to present out something about Forsyth Refuge and what we have going on, some of the areas that we have, some of the work we've been doing um, for wildlife and for the salt marshes of New Jersey. So I'm gonna dive right into my PowerPoint. So this will just take me a second to share. And I think we're there. Bam, hit that button. All right, great. So I still, even though it's now 2021, I still love to share that it was our 80th anniversary two years ago. And so we have our um, wonderful um, the logo here we had made up for the uh, 80th, and we had a lot of events that year. And we're glad it was 2019, not 2020, so we could pull off our events, and it was just a really great time. But fundamentally, I just want to talk about um, you know where we are in the map, why we're here, what we do. So this is map. map. All of these kind of orangey spots here are Forsyth Refuge. So I always want to point out to people that even though they're very familiar with the Wildlife Drive, which is most certainly our most highly visited part of the refuge and critically important, we actually go all the way up to Bird Township uh, and have a wonderful hiking trail up there. So Forsyth Refuge is part of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, so we're a federal refuge uh, within the refuge system um, that has refuges all over the country in Guam, Puerto Rico, or many, many places. So basically in the beginning of how we got started is we have a beautiful photo here of an American black duck and um, pilots would fly over and look for um, wildlife concentrations. It's particularly we were very much a duck refuge system uh, back in those, those times in the 1930s. And we were also kind of coming off of this dust bowl where a lot of habitat was lost for waterfowl, because many waterfowl do nest uh, in the kind of northern central part of the United States and up into southern Canada. So that was certainly a really critical area. So a big effort was made to try to identify sites that actually held waterfowl. And it was very important. Um, down the East Coast in the winter, we winter waterfowl, generally speaking, although we do have some things that stay in breed. So when they flew down, I'm looking out because I'm in my office looking out over the wildlife drive right now. But when they fly, flew around this area in the Great Bay and Reeds Bay area, they saw large concentrations of American black duck and Atlantic brant, which were already species of some concern. But at the same time, there were large, large populations. Um, and so they said, hey, there's a lot of birds here. We should make this refuge. So Brigantine National Wildlife Refuge is the original name of this part of the refuge. And here's a picture of our Atlantic brant. As a matter of fact, um, Atlantic brant, very interesting, we stay very late and there will be birds hanging around till May here in South Jersey. And as a matter of fact, I saw a flock of about 20 on my drive into work today. And he said, well, there they are, still around. So this is uh, actually kind of just to show a little bit of kind of how we started. So this little lighter area here was the original Brigantine National Wildlife Refuge. And then we actually added land, all of this land, um, became part of Barnegat National Wildlife Refuge in uh, the late 1960s. And then in the 1990s, we added this little piece here. So all of those things combined, things combined now form the Edwin B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge. And so, you know, the Brigantine Refuge, as I stated, was established for the birds, for the uh, Grant and the Black Duck. Um, the Barnegat Refuge was established for very different reasons. And so if you're familiar at all with the Barnegat Bay area, you might recognize here um, that this is, um, you know, Route 72 going east to Long Beach Island. And you can see here the construction occurring of Beach Haven West. And so this was an aerial photo that I found a while back in our files that basically showed how these salt marshes were being destroyed to build these um, lagoon communities. And this predated, so Barnegat was established in 1967, uh, predated many very important environmental laws like the NEPA here, the National Environmental Policy Act, the New Jersey Wetlands Act even uh, came a little bit later, the Clean Water Act. 
And this is in New Jersey is this CAFR law that really oversees uh, what kind of projects can occur and, and permitting. So, so the refuge, so this was really a grassroots effort to get the Barnegat refuge started because we were seeing thousands and thousands of acres be destroyed. And of course, you can't forget the Endangered Species Act was in the early 1970s uh, as well. So we had Barnegat Refuge, Brigantine Refuge, and then in 1984, they were combined because there were these two refuges right next to each other. And they were, were renamed as, a, you know, as, a, as one big refuge for Edwin B. Forsyth, who was, uh, you know, he was a state legislator, he was a congressman, and he loved fishing, he loved wildlife, and he was a big, played a big hand in some of those environmental laws being established. Um, so there is a connection there of value. So now we're, we're at over 48,000 acres. Uh, we're 50 miles long if you go from Brick to Galloway. And so we have quite a bit. We're actually the second largest refuge in our, our region, our Northeast region. So like I said, we're 48,000, 50 miles long. And so now we get into this breakdown of habitat. So we have a lot of salt marsh. 78% of, of the refuge is salt marsh. We have some forests, which is where a lot of our hiking trails are. We have a little bit of grassland, which is almost mostly what you see when you are at the visitor center here. Not much of it. And then barrier island beaches and coastal dunes, which is only 2%, but happens to be our most critically important habitat here for those species that we manage for. And I'm going to talk about that. Of course, we have open water, bay streams, all that fun stuff. And we are Ramsar wetland of international importance. So very, very important place. And on top of that, we're also, we also are the Brigantine National Wilderness Area, which is not the whole refuge, but it includes the Holgate Island, Little Beach Island, and then a, a chunk of marsh near uh, Mott's Creek. So I'm just going to point out a couple of sites. So here's our big red arrow pointing to where I'm sitting right now, which is our visitor area, our main headquarters area. And hopefully you have, uh, before COVID, been to the Visitor Information Center with our friend's gift, gift shop. Um, we are still, uh, we are open, not the Visitor Center or the, the indoor bathrooms, but we do um, still sell passes and have information for visitors uh, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, and that's 10 to 2. So we're kind of reduced hours, but we've been doing that for quite a few months now, and our wonderful volunteers staff that those three days a week. Uh, and at least it allows us to do a little bit of outreach, uh, you know, as we, as we get anxious and hopeful about the next couple of months opening up the visitors, visitor center again. But the wildlife drive has been open, has never been, uh, was never closed during COVID for any length of time, although we have occasional closures here and there for different work we do out on the wildlife drive or in the impoundment system. And then, of course, we have many trails and a boardwalk, and we have our wonderful new admin building that we've been in now for about three years, which uh, I sit in now. But of course, if you come to the visitor center, you, you know, you get to see some some neat things. And the story we're telling is that it's people and the and the wildlife, people in the marsh. We're 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 all here. We're together, um, and we have to figure out how to work together. Uh, and ex exist together. So we also have this lovely uh, gift shop for the friends, which we recently updated and redesigned. Um, and of course, the piece de resistance, which of course is our wildlife drive, eight miles long. Here's our here's where our visitor center sits, and you can go down to Gold Pond Tower and then come back. So it's a two way, and then this is a one way loop all the way around. And this is the famous dog leg. A lot of rare birds tend to show up there, and even on this side, which is sort of funny. And then you come back through the wooded area. So we love it. Great way to see wildlife. Here's the drive course, and you can see things like great blue herons, which always amazes me how they can overwinter. Um, Canada geese and the little muskrat. So they don't always hang out like this, but um, pretty fun shots to see. We, of course, have our wonderful boardwalk, our Leeds Eco Trail boardwalk. And it has an attached trail that sort of comes off the you know, from here over this way <laughs> towards and through the trees and comes out here to an overlook. Hopefully one day we'll join those and have a loop. Um, but this this um, boardwalk has gone, made it through two hurricanes, one being Hurricane Sandy in which the eye of the storm passed right over here. So we're very happy about the sustainability. And we have wonderful hiking trails, many of which are through wooded areas. I'm going to talk about Holgate now. So now we're at the tip of, of Long Beach Island. 
And I'm just going to mention, I cannot see the chat. So um, if, if there's any chat questions, I'm happy to be interrupted. So you can just let me know. Um, so here we are, Holgate Beach. So Holgate Beach, like I mentioned, is part of our wilderness area. And that was also a grassroots effort. Wilderness areas only occur on federal lands. Um, so we, we are one, we have 6,600 acres uh, that create, make that wilderness area. And essentially the wilderness area just creates another level of, um, of really protection for the sites that we have. It's just another um, layer of analysis when we are looking at the uses that we propose to do on um, those sites, whether they're public use or whether they're actual projects that we might do or habitat work. And so there is legislation um, that drives what those things are that we have to evaluate before we can do a certain, you know, certain things. Um, but we do love um, that Holgate Beach is open. Uh, it's closed now, as you can see by these dates. So September 1st, we uh, reopen. Uh, you can walk, right now you can walk on the beach until um, from September 1st through March 31st, but driving has actually been pushed back to March 15th because the piping plovers are coming earlier and earlier. So we're now getting vehicles off the beach sooner. Um, we added a new clamming trail, it's a hiking trail or walking trail that people can take, but the trail actually allows people to walk across the dune to get to the clamming beds, which is why we called it that. But great for bird watching and um, wildlife observation. But of the main the main reason why we have Holgate as part of the refuge and why it's so critically important to us is that it is um, a very important breeding site for piping plovers and other beach nesting birds. So this is one view of Holgate. It has it looks different every day. The, this is an old picture. This is our boundary line here. So this is if you're at the parking lot there at, at you know at the kind of the uh, community of Holgate on the southern end of uh, Long Beach Island where the road ends kind of looking south towards Atlantic City, which you can see here. Um, and this has been this deep, this has been, the, the shoreline's been here. Uh, it moves all over the place um, and signs wash in. We have hurricanes, so it's constantly changing. Here's our climbing trail that I mentioned. This just shows that um, it's marked with these um, markers here, and then we want people to really stay between the markers as they uh, work the trail to get to the back of the refuge, or the back side, I should say the base side. And we have fun things like um, turns, and we have oyster catchers, and of course we have pipe plovers, and this is the plover chick, uh, and, and all shorebirds, because they nest on the ground, um, are born with big feet and big legs that they grow into because they have to pretty much jump up, dry off, and start feeding on their own. And the parents help them along with the feeding, but it uh, goes pretty quick. So they are mobile because it's dangerous to sit and still to sit still on a very open, flat beach. So that's why they always look so funny when our little puffballs on legs. So this is just a little bit of talking about habitat changes over time. So here's a photo from um, 2020, 2010, excuse me. This was before Hurricane Sandy. You can see very typically, you know, we were just getting chewed in here, really losing the beachfront and losing opportunities um, for habitat. And we weren't really, we were really losing our plover numbers. We had, you know, this beautiful marsh back here. We even had some nice pretty nice maritime forest still, which by this time was mostly shrubs. We'd had trees in the past, but that's been chewed away by the ocean. Um, but you didn't see a whole lot of areas where the sand could actually get pushed over and through to the bay. Um, and this ends up being incredibly important habitat for plovers and other birds, but particularly piping plovers. And piping plovers, why we manage for them is because they are on the endangered species list. They are threatened. Um, under the Endangered Species Act, and we, uh, it's our highest priority species here at this refuge. So after the hurricane came through, um, you can see that a lot of that sand that was on the beach actually got pushed over, and we actually lost a lot of marsh on the backside. But what happened is you had this pushing through of the sand, and that allowed these big flats to um, occur. So now when we look at the beach, we see 
um, a continue. Now this is um, two. Well, I guess that's a year and a half ago now, but uh, continued um, overwashing of the the of the island for the sand. So there are some incredibly important habitats here for uh, piping plovers and. The reason why it's so important to have sand on the backside of the island is because for foraging. So these big open flats get, um, you know, the tide washes over them. And in that sand is where the plovers are going for their food. And so there's just much more, much more, you know, they're eating little worms and things that are in that sand and they're picking and pecking at the surface and, and you know, maybe go into the sand a little bit with that, that bill. And so, that's important to have an area that's continually being rewashed and re nourished by the water. Um, on this side, you know, we always when we think of sanderlings that run along the shore and they're constantly like running back and forth with the shore to get at that area that just got overwashed. Well, if you're feeding on this side, you don't have to have that constant race with the ocean. And of course, for a little plover that's only like that big, you know, the ocean's kind of dangerous. So having these foraging areas is really uh, wonderful at, um, at Holgate. And so since Hurricane Sandy, we've seen quite an amazing change in our number of piping plovers. So you can see right the year of the storm. So this is the summer before Sandy, which was in October. You know, we had 32 pairs of birds. We fledged 20 birds, but we didn't even get one chick per pair to um, fledge. And you gotta have, you know, you gotta, you wanna have more than one bird fledging, you know, flying away and free to fly per pair to, to, to keep your species going. The year after Sandy, we didn't see much change, and you wouldn't expect to because birds have to find your site. And so the two, second year after Sandy, then we started to see, and then, you know, amazingly, not as many pairs, a ton of chicks, and an amazing rate of success. And so since then, we've seen the number of pairs go up and kind of stay up. Um, the number of chicks last year, we fledged the most chicks we've ever fledged ever on, on Holgate. And this is Holgate plus Little Beach Island, I want to make sure you understand. And we had an absolutely fantastic success rate. Um, so this is, you know, when you're really hopeful that the right things are happening out there for pluckers. Also, I have to mention that we, we basically are supporting 40, nearly 40% 40 of the piping plover you know, population in the state of New Jersey. About that same amount is um, also supported at Sandy Hook, which is another federal property. And the rest, the last 20 or so percent are little pairs that are here and there in other sites. And there's a little bit of increasing activity in Monmouth County. So very important. So here's our piping plover nest. And you can see all the little pieces of shell that they gather up, broken little pieces, and they make a little bowl. And we've also done some banding studies in the last couple of years. We're uh, done with them now, but we did a couple of years of banding so we could actually uh, see who came back the next year. So you get these little colored leg bands so you can identify individuals. And here we are releasing our bird. This is an adult actually being released that they were able to catch and put some bands on. So again, um, I told you, you know, obviously how thrilled we are to have all these birds uh, on the refuge now. And you can see this is just over the last 20 years, how important the refuge has become to the overall population of the state of New Jersey. We're, we're struggling to have numbers of, of pairs, numbers of birds in our state overall. But of the birds that we have, the refuge is a huge percentage of. And that's why we remain so critically important and why the beach has to stay closed and we have to keep dogs off the beach uh, in our beach where we have the plovers and just to keep um, those activities, you know, halted. And that will be remain uh, what we do in the future. I wanna point out this island here called Cedar Bonnet Island, which is just on Route 72 before you hit Long Beach Island. And this is a new site that I hope some of you at least have heard about if you haven't visited. And this is actually a, an area that was um, salt marsh many, many years ago here in the sign, you can see that. And then a containment dike was constructed around the marsh. And then when they did a bunch of dredging on either side of this island, you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, they just dumped all the dredge material on the marsh in the containment. And so we lost all that great habitat. 
And so a couple years ago, um, I was approached to kind of re, re kind of re to fix that problem, to restore it because they were doing the highway work on Route 72. And so we actually created 18 acres of salt marsh on a site that you could never even walk down. This this trail here used to be just covered with um, poison ivy and green briars. It was impossible to get through. And so um, this was a project that was funded by the Federal Highways and the Department of Transportation. And they were able to create a wonderful hiking trail. You also um, can go bicycling there. And um, so now we have public access at this site. In addition to that, like I mentioned, we had all this, this area. So this is all salt marsh here, all natural. This is the area where all that material that was dredged had been dumped on. And then it grew up into trees and shrubs. And so what the other part of the project was, so here's, here's that project site before they put those dikes in, beautiful functioning marsh, even had a creek going through here, which is long gone. Um, and so now you can see that that creek is gone, even though we still have a little line, but you can see um, that previous. So you can see how what happened was, is they actually came in, cut, cut some holes in the dikes, created new creeks, and dug this whole area out and dumped it here, which is where the hiking trail is. And so now this is a little bit later after the construction's been completed and you have this wonderful hiking trail that goes around here and we have a functioning salt marsh in here, which is still being monitored, um, but we're really excited about this project. So this is Cedar Bonnet Island, it's open every day, uh, pack in, pack out. But there are some nice overlooks here where you can sit. This is a nice winter day. Um, but you could sit out here, you can bring some, have a picnic. We just ask that you take it home with you and uh, enjoy this site. So the next site I wanna mention is um, here at Enos Pond. Enos Pond is actually a county park, um, but we have a fun relationship with the park because they have a nice site that you can visit. There's a picnic, big picnic area. You can get reserve their, their site there, the bigger site, and also, they have hiking trail, but it actually, you cross, you start at their site, and then you actually cross our boundary line and you go on the refuge. So we have a fun big loop there. This is um, in Lacey Township. And um, now you can see this is the Orchid River here, if you're familiar with that area. And then this is all refuge marsh down out here. So um, pretty great opportunity there, but nice facilities and trails. Here's again, beautiful woodland trail, very wide, very nice and flat, very nice area. This is actually on the parks piece, but it's a fun little overlook here and you can see a great bit right there. So it's a pretty, pretty site. And I wanna show you also uh, lastly, in terms of visitor opportunities, the Camp Wildlife Trail way up in Brick Township. And um, this is a great trail. Um, like I mentioned, we got this area back in the 1990s and it pretty which came with the trail, but a lot of work was done to improve it. And then in 2015, we did a big sign, uh, sign refurbishment, and we also had gotten Hurricane Sandy money to improve the trail. So the trail would, was kind of, you had to slog through some parts of it years ago, and um, we were able to really upgrade it nicely. And so now it, you have a, it's kind of a there and back trail, but if you go there and back, you get in a three and a half mile walk, which is pretty fun. And it's beautiful. You come out on this um, one of these lagoons, so it's kind of fun to come out here. It's tidal water, get a view of the marsh as you're coming in. But again, one of these just beautiful. It's a spring day, um, beautiful trail to walk through, walk down. And this one also allows. Um, I didn't mention dogs before on the other trails, but this one allows dog walking on leashes, of course, and please pick up after your pet, and also allows bike riding. Now I wanna shift gears and get away a little bit from visitor services as we call it and, and the stuff that you know you get to do on a mar under the refuge and talk a little bit more about the other work we do. You know, our, prior, our primary work and why we're here, which is this all the work we're doing. So on habitat. So um, this just shows you the different habitat types in the, ref types in the refuge. And you can see there's a bright green is salt marsh. So you can see that we have this 32,000 acres of salt marsh all the way up to brick. And you can see this the wooded areas I mentioned, a um, little bit of pine lands habitat here. And then of course our beach, our two beaches here. So like I said, we have 32,000 acres of salt marsh and the salt marsh situation is concerning. Um, 
we first of all there are lots of different kinds of salt marshes but we very generally refer to low marsh which gets inundated twice a day every day and high marsh which generally gets inundated by seawater with high big you know, big events storm high tide like high high tides um, they're not going to get inundated every day so just because of that you get you end up with different types of vegetation um, and so that high marsh um, as sea level rises you know we're losing the high marsh and so that's a concern because there are certain species of wildlife that really depend on those high marshes so um, on the refuge you know so so 62% of all high marsh on the Atlantic coast of New Jersey is on the refuge. So 6,000 of these 32,000 acres is high is um, high marsh. So we have a huge responsibility and a big chunk of it. Um, this, is a, this is a bit of a mixed marsh um, and this is showing much more of a kind of a, a short um, low marsh, but just, you know, these are very typical scenarios where you'll see this big marsh. This is a channel that was dug years ago, but then you can also get these natural open pond areas. And then there's a bigger, um, you know, creek or stream running through here. And then of course there's very often houses. So when we look at these salt marsh habitats, we're really focusing on a couple of species. Of course, we have our diamondback terrapin turtles, which the time of terrapins, which we don't focus on. Um, I know other, Many other institutions do, like the Wetlands Institute in Stone Harbor has, does a lot of work with terrapins. EP does work with terrapins, but we are focusing more on migratory birds. So for us, our two biggest species of concern in these um, high salt marsh areas are the Eastern Black Rail, the very hard to see Eastern Black Rail, which was just put on the endangered species list. And this is a salt marsh sparrow. And this is a very typical photo you'll see of them with their legs kind of like splayed out and holding on to these, these blades of salt of marsh grass. Um, and they are not listed on the endangered species list, but they might as well be because they are really struggling. So if you look at it, 37% of the total global salt marsh sparrow population breeds in the state of New Jersey. And that's incredible. And you could say very similar things around the populations of black duck and brant that we saw, we talked about earlier as to why the, the brigantine refuge first got established. Those birds aren't breeding here, but they're, all their populations are in the state of New Jersey in terms of like, not all, let, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase that. A significant portion of the populations of those birds winter um, in the state of New Jersey, all their populations winter on the East Coast up and down between Long Island and a little bit further south of here. So we have some really important salt marshes for these birds. And of course, we know sea level is rising and there is no doubt about it. And this is the Atlantic City gauge that shows that to us. Uh, four millimeters a year right here. And then we also look at, you know, people do what vulner vulnerability indices. And you can see that we're right, you know, we have our, you know, kind of our, Chesapeake marshland areas here and, and the New Jersey marshes. And we're all really in this very concerning, very high risk area, vulnerability due to sea level rise. So what are we doing about it? Um, first thing is to know the challenge. And so what we do is we have um, what we call surface elevation tables. So this is not one. <laughs> this is some people with a jackhammer uh, in the marsh drilling these rods into the ground to basically make a fixed point and to which they are going to put a piece of equipment so they can measure the marsh elevation. And the reason why they stand on these boards is that they don't wanna walk on this marsh because if you walk on that marsh, then you're just gonna completely mess up your experiment because you wanna measure the natural accretion or the you know, whatever that, nat that natural change in the elevation of the marsh is. So I'm gonna show you. So first you use that jackhammer and you just drill, you just push, push, push these rods down until you can't push anymore. And it's usually about 60 or so feet into the ground. And then you, with concrete, set this, and then you just have this piece of pipe sticking out. And then that's what you're gonna put your measuring device on later uh, when you come back out. And you can see that they've just put this in and this area here has not been walked on and it looks great. So this is the big measuring device. It's not um, electronic. It is 
little rods that we will push down into the soil, all these little rods. And each one of these is a little data point. And, um, and you are measuring millimeters of difference in the elevation. And so basically you collect all this data, you compare it over years and you see like, what is the marsh doing? Is it getting higher and higher? Or is it getting lower and lower? And then you compare that to sea level rise, which we know is getting higher. And so what you wanna know is, is the marsh keeping up with the sea level rise or is, is it losing ground against the sea level rise? And we have parts of the wreckage where it's keeping up and we have parts where it's losing ground. And this is uh, what that would look like then when you go back out in the boat to check on your site. Here's that little spot that where the pipe came out. And then we have some other things that we do around it to check on elevation um, and, and, the, and, and how the marsh is progressing. And what I'll just mention is the reason, you know, when you think of the marsh, it's not like your garden. In your garden, you plant your plants and then you have a bunch of dead vegetation you know, winter comes, it all dies, you clean it up and you start from scratch. Well, on a marsh, you don't do that. There's no one's gardening in the marsh. So you basically, all that marsh vegetation, like you can see in this photo, gets beaten down and it will lay down. And um, as the new growth comes through, you know, then you're kind of building on top of that marsh that you had last year. In the meantime, all of this vegetation is actually collecting sediment. So this tide comes in, we have a high tide here this particular day, it's gonna have sediment in it. And so that's gonna get trapped in this dying vegetation. And that's really how, that's what's making the marsh build up. It's building up on itself over time. Now, of course, we know marshes sink. We're actually still sinking due to the withdrawal of the ice age ice, which is very hard to believe. So. You know, we look at everything now and think, oh yeah, it's fine, but it's, it's everything's shifting and uh, you don't see it, can't see it. And so, right, so, uh, back up. yeah, so these right here, these little pipes are marking these little corners. And so what they did is they laid down feldspar, which is this white material. So over time, you can cut in there, like cut a piece of cake out of the ground. And you can see that when they put this down, this mud and sediment and vegetation, got deposited since this layer was laid on the marsh surface, uh, which is pretty amazing. So it's another way to understand how the marsh is accreting and then comparing that to sea level rise. And so we have data points all over the marsh. So you can see we just have all these, this is what we do and we're, we're measuring for birds, we're measuring for um, vegetation, we're measuring for what critters are in the water column. So a lot of data collection. So that's one piece we're doing. So we're basically co we're collecting data over a large time frame to understand what um, is going on out there, so we can start to get a better picture. In the meantime, we know we have places where the marsh is really struggling. And one of those places is in Berkeley Township at a place called called Good Luck Point. Um, if you're familiar with this area, you know that there used to be almost 500 telephone poles out here in these marshes because it was an old. AT&T ship to shore communication site. We got rid of those a couple of years ago, very happily. Um, and, and during that process, we also identified that this marsh here, kind of on the inside of the road, is really struggling because it's not getting the right kind of tidal flushing back and forth um, to the greater marsh. So this marsh actually looks a lot different than this marsh. And we're concerned about that. So this past year in December, we finally got to do what we were wanting to do, which is to work with the Department of Transportation. And as they were dredging some of the um, creeks in the area, they actually pumped that dredged material instead of you know, putting it you know, some, somewhere else, they put it on to the marsh. And so it was coming out this pipe, this is just a pipe full of slurry and just kind of spitting out here. And then this, this machine was sort of moving the pipe around because um, it's really heavy. <laughs> So, um, and that was at that site. And so that was, like I said, out here. We've also done other projects to improve tidal flow. This road was restricting the back and forth of the water. Um, this project here is actually called Main Point. And I'll show you the map. It's down here now, north of Cedar Bonnet Island. North is Route 72, where a lot of material had been placed here, again, from dredging. 
And this is now, you know, become just full of Phragmites, which is giant called giant reed. It's um, not native, it's highly invasive, and it doesn't like salt water, but it loves fresh water. And so you can see of a monoculture here, you lost a marsh to this. And so we work with the Ocean County Mosquito Commission um, on this site here. So this is it relative to Cedar Bonnet Island or Route 72. And what they did is they went in with on this area, and just this is what it looked like 10 years ago. And they came in with their equipment and you can see where they tracked all over the place, but they cut the drainage canal. And I call it drainage canal because that's what we really refer to them as, but they're really improving hydrological flow through the area. So now water that's coming from here, here, and working its way uh, from these old existing um, ditches can now work through the site. And like I said, Phragmites doesn't like um, salt water. So you get some areas now where you actually can see where all this dead, these dead vegetation, all these little holes, that's dead Phragmites because now it's getting flushed with um, salt water. So first the vet, that vegetation, see all the standing dead Phragmites? This was last summer. Uh, and then you can see this marsh grass is coming in and taking over on its own. So you actually can see the change. Now it's not a one size fits all, but this was an opportunity to try some experimentation and we learned that, yeah, there are places where we can just increase the hydrological flow, flush these areas with salt water and you can kill that Phragmites. And the reason why Phragmites is a problem because it's a monoculture, it's one type of habitat and it's not native to the area. So we always want our marshes to be um, you know, native marshes. And uh, uh, along with the native marsh grass come all the critters that go with the native marsh grass. Uh, going back to our salt marsh sparrow story, our Eastern black rail. So it all goes together. This is just a, an area where we had gone down where uh, it showed where um, the Ocean County Mosquito Commission had dug this ditch. And so it looks kind of the same, you know, on both sides here, not a super big improvement, but um, you can see that it still takes time. But essentially what's gonna happen is, is that this soil here will continue to suck the um, salt water out and up and um, what you can see here is a little bit different size in the height of these two marsh grasses after just one or two years of this area kind of leaching the salt water in. So it's already taking a bit of a hit and it didn't grow nearly as vibrant as the Phragmites on this side. Um, and so that's pretty exciting because, because the flow of the water is going this way. Um, Let's see, I cannot remember what I was trying to say with that. Oh, that was my end picture. So <laughs> that's just a little bit of a flavor of what we're doing on the refuge. Um, one thing I always wanna encourage people to do if you can, if you're looking for a way to get involved, we are looking for volunteers. Um, fundamentally, we need them to work in our garden here at the visitor center um, in Galloway. And we also um, need people to work in the visitor center. Um, and so if you're interested, please call, give us a call. We'll talk with you about um, something you might be able to do. But I didn't hit all the things that we provide the public in terms of uses, but you know, obviously we have wildlife observation, photography, we do allow hunting and fishing, we have wonderful programs around that. Environmental education, we've been doing more online programs, um, the Facebook page, and I had put the link for the Facebook page um, in the chat, so you might see that. We have Instagram, you know, we, we, we try to be cool <laughs> and try to stay up to date. Um, and that's it. And so I'll ask for questions. So our visitor uh, information center here, you can see once in a while we do get lovely rainbows. And um, so I'm gonna stop sharing now and I can always pop it back on if somebody needs to see anything. And I'll just ask if there's any questions, of course. Thank you so much, Virginia. That was wonderful. So any questions anyone has, just put them in the uh, Q&A or in the chat. You can raise your virtual hand and we can unmute you if you want to ask with your voice. Looks like Adaria has her hand up, is that? All right, great. Um, go ahead, Adaria. 
You should be able to unmute now. Oh. Oh. Or, okay, mm -hmm. here we go. Um, Daria typed, how can I get a copy of the map with all the parts of the Edwin B. Forsyth? Yes, um, on our website, I, we should have the brochure on the website, but what we have also on the website is we have an interactive map. So you can actually like zoom in on where you want to go on the refuge and see all the things you can do. And so just go to the visitor part of the part of the, of the website and look for maps. But the interactive map is pretty great because it has everything on there. Um, we're getting more and more away from hard copy anything, which is a frustration for me. But um, right now I don't probably have a great map. It shows you every single thing that I just talked about, mostly because some of those things are pretty new. But look around on the website to see if there's any, um, you know, to see what we have on there for uh, brochures. Great. And um, there was a question about if there's any nesting pairs of bald eagles at the refuge. Yeah, there are. There are a few. Some of them are nowhere near where we have public use areas. Um, there's been a crowd favorite this last couple of years uh, near the Wildlife Drive um area the headquarters area and um so if you come down or go by lily lake road they're nesting right on lily lake and you can actually get pretty great views of the nest um they're nesting right next to our intern housing <laughs> so pretty fun um of course the area's closed we don't want people going to the parking lot but it's right along the road so we understand that people are going to stop and look at them we just ask that you do it safely uh, but that nest was able to, that pair was able to um, hatch and fledge one chick two, two years ago, which was their first attempt that we're aware of. Then last year they moved to a different tree away from the Lily Lake and kind of back off the wildlife drive. Um, and we know they fledged two chicks. And then now they, this year, got very confused. At first they were over there and then they came back over to Lily Lake Road. And um, they stayed on Lily Lake Road this year. So we know that one, um, one egg so far has hatched. So they started really late. So they'll be one of the late pairs. Um, but um, they're not, there's no camera or anything on, on these. But I will mention that we do have an Osprey cam that the Friends of Foresight support. And we just were able to get it up and running in the nick of time last week. So if you go, if you Google Foresight Osprey cam, You'll see our birds and they're out there setting up housekeeping and, and having them to, you know, getting their nest ready. So that's pretty great. And somebody had, um, Linda has visited the uh, refuge and seen short-eared owls there and asks if they nest in New Jersey or if they just overwinter in the salt marsh. Yeah, they pretty much just overwinter in the short-eared owl that we had this year in the wildlife drive area was an incredible rarity. That is not, that has not been a staple of wildlife drive viewing, you know, over the past 80 years. So I am not sure why that bird did what it did. <laughs> it was put on quite an amazing show for people. People got great photos of it. Generally, those lower, um, or I guess I should say those higher salt marsh marshes that don't flood as much as the wildlife drive area does, tend to be the better wintering areas for short owls. Um, and so those, a really good place to see them normally is um, like in our wilderness area near Mutt's Creek and um, that area, area of marsh. So um, they don't nest in New Jersey, but they're pretty incredible. We have another question. Um, if any part of the refuge on the map can be developed in any capacity ever. Oh, so can can the refuge be developed? Yeah. In terms of building buildings on it. Yeah. So, you know, the whole purpose of the refuge is to have land in perpetuity for wildlife. Um, I never say never because the federal government is a very multi-layered agency and so there could at some time be some need that we can't anticipate where something has to occur 
that it would have to be under the guise of you know national security, that kind of thing. But we are, you know, the whole point of the refuge is to per be perpetually, you know, have wildlife habitat. You know, the great thing about our agency is that we are, you know, how we do things is we look at what we have and we measure that against all of these concerns we have, both in a, on a bigger landscape scale and within the context of South Jersey. So we are allowed to, we are allowed, we are expected to determine what our highest priorities are going to be in terms of wildlife management. And we come to that with our partners, like the state DEP and many other partners we have. So for us, the priority is the puppy plovers. And then now we're getting doing the salt marsh work, which was, you know, 10 years ago, we were hardly even doing this level of work. It's amazing what we're doing now. So that's the purpose for why we're here in terms of providing wildlife habitat. So, you know, nowhere in there ever does it say, oh, we're going to take this big marsh and we're going to develop it. You know, that's, that goes completely against um, the whole mission of the Fish and Wildlife Service. Great. We have a couple more questions. Um, we have, um, Daniel mentions that there, uh, he heard that there was a railroad built ages ago where the refuge now stands mm -hmm. and asked if a hurricane uh, destroyed it. Yeah, so this is one of the shortest lived um, railroads in history, I think, the uh, Brigantine Railroad. Um, and we have a nice panel, by the way, in the southeast corner of the Wildlife Drive that was paid for by the Friends of Foresight that I, off, I uh, extend the invitation for you to stop and look at before you turn that left, left turn. But as, and we have a nice map on there, it shows this. But essentially the, the Wildlife Drive was a railroad for the Southern uh, Dyke. And then a wooden trestle was built from that Southeast corner out to the town of Brigantine. And it took, you know, certainly years to build all that. And I thought, oh boy, I think it was finished in like 1897 or something. And then in like 1903, we had a hurricane and something big before we named storms and named hurricanes. And it pretty much wiped out the trestle. So that was the end of the railroad. <laughs> And it was never money maker. It was poorly conceived. But if you know what you're doing and you have a boat, you can actually still see a few of the wooden trestle beams between here and Brigantine, which is pretty cool. And you can see them on aerial photography if you know where you're looking. So pretty great. So look for that. Um, another question. When there are burns, most recently at Wildlife Drive, do you notice the wildlife shying away from the burned areas? No, um, you know, I guess it's yes and no, right? So if you're, you know, if you're maybe a, a rodent uh, in that immediate um, air time following the burn, you're probably not going to find a whole lot of places to hide, or um, you know, maybe you need to collect vegetation like a muskrat does for its its nest area and its its um, hut. But um, but then the, on the flip side, species that do um, like big open spaces to hunt and forage take advantage of that area. So raptors, harriers, shorter owl, you know, they were able to forage over that big burnt area. And um, and you know now we're going to be we're greening up. I haven't gone out there in the last week or two, but it's going to be green so quickly that it's really you're never you're not going to know in three months there was a burn out there. So. Uh, that was a really great opportunity for us. I'm, so, I'm glad somebody asked about the fire because we hadn't burned here in 10 years and it was really needed and um, it was done super safely. Um, I'm really proud of how it was handled and done. And we were able to reduce the vegetation that we, the unwanted vegetation in that area. Um, so very excited about that. Right, and Virginia, can you tell us one more time where to find the uh, map on the website? Yeah, um, as a matter of fact, while we're sitting here, I can answer questions and find the link and put it up there for you. <laughs> You're better at multitasking than I am. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of, in the, in the website, there's sort of the site that's that's visitor. Um, let's see, I'm going to click on maps. Let me see what's in here for you. This goes to the interactive map. Oops. And then there are um, the Brigantine unit hiking trails, which is a little bit of an older map, but 
Unfortunately, don't have a ton of stuff anymore in paper. And if you, know, if you have more questions about that, just give me a call. You know, I'm happy to help people out with more information. There's another link to the um, trail map brochure, the refuse brochure. Oh, thank you. And uh, there's another question um, asking about as all this work and research is going on out there, are there, um, do you find any uh, Lenny Lenape artifacts or um, evidence of past, um, past activity? These questions, these are really great questions. Yeah. Thank you so much. So um, before we can do, before we can disturb soil, um, we have to work, rightly so, with our cultural um, little regional archaeologists. So we do a cultural resource review. And so there are known sites on the refuge, of course. We can imagine um, a high area near the mark would particularly be particularly important. Um, to the, um, you know, the Lenape people and would have been used, um, you know, in their travels, uh, eating shellfish and, and um, having safe high sites above the marsh. Um, talk about the bugs being bad, that must have been tough though. I sometimes think about that, about people that inhabit coast, have, you know, historically have inhabited coastal marshes who lived uh, off and of the land and that just must have been hard. <laughs> But, um, so if we're gonna do anything, we first have to do this review. Um, so we aren't actively looking to do uh, or to look for um, artifacts, we, but we do know where they have been seen. And of course, as you would imagine, many of those sites would have been cleared years ago and they're not cleared anymore. They're now grown up, they in forest. And of course, we don't tell the public about where those are, but we, we know we know what we know, and I know there's a ton more we don't know, but we're not in the business of um, turning up the land. So much of it, you know, would likely um, sort of sit underground. I hope that's helpful. So someone else is uh, planning to come down for some uh, photography and uh, wants to, catch the sunset, stay over, and come back the next morning for sunrise. So what time do you have to be off the drive? What time can you enter in the morning? Yeah, we try to keep up with the sun, but it, we're not perfect. <laughs> so it is tough to get a sunrise shot, um, but we're basically open, you know, sunrise to sunset, give or take. Um, so obviously, you know, once the sun has gone down, we expect people are moving off the drive. Um, and there's no guarantee we'll be open at sunset just because um, that's a constantly changing. Um, the gate, we set the gate for the time, but the gate time doesn't change as the, as the sunlight, daylight increases every day. So it's pretty tricky to get a sun, uh, a sunrise shot. Plus we don't open till sunrise, so, sorry. Okay, we have another question here. Um, some uh, Linda saw a cattle egret on Wildlife Drive once and asked if this is a migrant species attracted to the Wildlife Drive habitat or if she was just lucky. Lucky, um, they're definitely not, this is not wild cattle egret habitat out here. Not, they're not a salt marsh bird. But this, the one, I know one of the ones was basically hanging outside my office here in the median one time for a while. And so you would expect them maybe a little bit up here on the, the kind of on the bluff overlooking the wildlife drive. But yeah, that was pretty much luck, um, but that's foresight. Like you get lucky here. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was an American Avocet on the wildlife drive. I hadn't been out there in a long time. I was like, oh, there's an Avocet, March. I mean, that's crazy. So, um, well, we've had a she egrets, we've had roseate spoonbills. Um, we get some stuff out here, so it's pretty great. All right, any other questions? There's some really good ones. Well, I'll just encourage people to visit our sites. Um, like I said, please, um, Contact me as a matter of fact, let me just in the my email in here. If anyone have any follow-up questions, don't you don't have to capitalize that F in there. Um basically, um 
we're here to help you engage with the refuge, you know, and we're looking to do more and more of that, of course, every year. Um, but we have the Friends of Foresight, like I said. Um, you know, last year we were able to do a lot of uh, online stuff. Um, probably going to be slowing down a little bit on that this year because we're having some staff changes and we're short a couple people now, but it's um, just the way it is what we do. So, but I really want to thank everybody for coming and to uh, watching, listening, and asking questions. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we thank you, Virginia. You did a great job. Oh, one more question. Mm -hmm. All I right. See it. Snowy Owls. <laughs> Snowy Owls drawn to Holgate and Wildlife Drive. Yeah. You know, it's so funny. The snowy owl is such a uh, such a tricky bird because when they're here, they're here because they're looking for food, but they're also incredibly uh, not shy. Like they're not shy. You, we, you don't want to approach them. We're not asking people to do that, but people get really concerned when people are, you know, in, you know, 10 feet away from an owl taking a photo of it. Like, oh, you must be stressing the bird. And, um, you know, the wildlife drive is for people to enjoy wildlife in addition to the birds using the, the area. So when there is a snowy owl on the wildlife drive, um, you know, we take, we share a photo of it. It's because we want people to come out and use the drive safely and enjoy the wildlife. Um, there, are, there are many places where the birds don't hang out in such a way that they are seen or heard or observed. And that's, you know, Holgate. The Holgate gets a ton of birds. And a lot of people, you know, unless they really know what they're doing, don't see them there. So my view is, is that um, in the winter time, you know, and especially a lot of these birds are young, um, you know, we're not chasing them down, but if they're gonna choose to pop up and sit on a rock next to a wildlife drive, I can't, um, I've heard made that choice. I don't know what else to say, <laughs> but, there's a lot of them out there that make other choices. And so we are hoping those birds are smarter than the ones that sit by the side of the road.